Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, the webinar of the SSIS Coffee Talk series continues, and today's topic is trafficking and exploitation of children and youth and the documentation of that in the social service information system. We always like to give it about 30 seconds to a minute to make sure that everybody gets logged in, situated. Um, hopefully you guys all have your coffee and caffeine ready to go as we walk you through this presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and like I said, we'll get started here in about another 30 seconds. Well, good morning once again, everybody. My name is Eric Kratt, and I am the SSIS lead trainer and liaison between the uh, Division of Child Safety and Permanency and the Minnesota Child Welfare Training Academy. Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Um, I just want to let you know that Heidi Morris sent out the presentation along with the new uh, SEYSTY uh, tutorial for SSIS data entry yesterday. And if you didn't receive that, um, I'm going to go ahead and throw some links into the chat for you in just a second here. So these links should um, open up for you uh, and you, then you can download them. What I recommend that you do is that you Download them using Microsoft Edge or Google Chrome. So the first one that I'm gonna throw into the chat here is uh, the new tutorial. I'm gonna change this to all panelists and attendees. So it's just at the panelists getting this. And then we are gonna make some updates to these as well. So uh, we'll be sending those out in an SSIS update and a mentor blast um, after the webinar as well. Last minute changes always happen, that's okay. So the first link that you should see in the chat is a link to the tutorial as I've indicated. And the second link is to the PowerPoint presentation itself. And again, we will be making some updates to those and send them out in a mentor blast in an SSIS update. Um, a couple tips about Zoom. When we start to share our computer screen, different things happen for different people. Um, sometimes the window minimizes to the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Usually there's an arrow in that box that will allow you to expand. If there doesn't seem to be any way around it for you, if you don't see that arrow to expand, um, I've heard that simply logging out of the webinar and returning to the webinar will help with that. Um, hopefully it doesn't come to that for you. Um, and also when we share our screen, uh, we, we take over your monitor completely, but if you wanna still see your task panel at the bottom of, of the presentation, uh, you can go up to the very top menu um, and uh, select zoom ratio and you can change those zoom ratios to side by side or um, view task panel as well. So uh, housekeeping in order. If you have any questions, we like you to refer those questions to the Q&A section. So if you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, an icon that says Q&A. Uh, please refrain from putting comments or questions in, or you can put comments in the chat, but questions and answers, please, or questions, please put them in the Q&A so that we can track them better. Um, so once again, my name is Eric, and we'll be walking you through the SSIS components of our presentation today, but I'd like to turn it over to our fellow presenters 
and have them introduce themselves. Thanks so much for being here, Sarah and Darianne. Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Sarah, are you there? Well, good, doing well. Hello? Yep. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> You've got me now. Okay. Okay. All well, right. We're turning it over to you for introductions. So we're going to have you introduce yourself and then we'll have Darianne introduce herself. Okay, um, let me know if the tech problem continues. I see a pretty big delay on my end. Um, okay, so again, good morning, everyone. Welcome. I hope everyone is doing well and has their coffee with them for this coffee talk um, or tea if you're a tea drinker. My name is Sarah Ladd, and I am one of the human trafficking child protection coordinators at the Department of Human Services. Um, I am really excited to be here to talk with you about documenting trafficking and exploitation within SSIS. So um, I'm going to let my co-presenter introduce herself and then we'll get going. Good morning. Excuse me. Uh, my name is Darianne McCormick and I work at the Department of Human Services in the um, safety unit with uh, Sarah Ladd, and um, Sarah will be doing most of our presenting today, but I will be here if needed for questions. All right, awesome. So um, Eric, if you wouldn't mind sharing, I don't see the slides right now, would you mind putting the slides up? Um, I am going to in the next, <laughs> you'll notice on this very next slide, we're already just to touch off our agenda, but in the next six minutes or so until 9.15, I'm going to try and give you a bit of the overview um, and the context, including a preview of how we see, could you go to the next slide, Eric? Thank you. Um, the top five things that we want you to know, or the top five pitfalls that we commonly see, you can look at it from either perspective. Um, and then we will we will jump in to our if three main topics. We will tackle each of those kind of topic areas um, and the subtopics under them. So subtopic one, we are probably going to begin closer to 9:15. Topic two around 9:30. Topic three around 9:45. And then we'll do a recap and open for discussion. So as Eric said, you can feel free to put questions into the Q&A or comments into the chat um, throughout the time together. Um, and is it possible, Eric, in the discussion portion for people to actually unmute themselves or in the Q&A portion for people to actually unmute? And if they need to say something out loud that's a little complicated for a Q&A box or, um, or not? Well, unfortunately, this isn't a meeting style. Um, webinar okay. so it's the participants can only type questions into the Q&A we can't hear them unfortunately but this right. is the only way we can have a large audience of people through uh, no using. problem no problem so then what I will say is as we're going through please add your questions in we have some a little bit of dedicated time to, to answer those as they into each topic and then at the end we have a bit of a longer time set aside hopefully for some discussion. And really, that's going to be us kind of discussing and based on the comments that you've submitted in the chat, and we'll come up with a creative way to do that. And then after the fact, you can feel free to email me, call me, email or call Darianne. We would love to talk to you about kind of the longer, more complex questions that you might have that um, come from what we talk about. So, okay, let's jump in. Next slide, please. All right, so why do we need to document these things? Um, I wanted to start here because trafficking and exploitation are newer concepts within SSIS. And hopefully by this point, many or all of you are aware of the changes that happened in 2017 that now require response to reports of trafficking. Um, 
I just say that at the beginning here to give you the context of this is all relatively new. The first time that exploitation and trafficking were mentioned in SSIS was back in 2016 when the um, at that time the SEY screen was created. And so a lot has changed in about five years time. So why do we need to document all these new things? I know that you all have your plates very, very full. You're documenting many things in SSIS and we don't want to overburden you with lots of extra stuff. So why do we need to do this? There are a number of federal laws that now require it. And these laws keep changing. There have now been four different laws that, that require documentation of trafficking and exploitation um, as part of the response that's now required by the child welfare system broadly. And so each state has, has adopted those differently and implemented them differently, but there are a number of federal laws that then create reporting requirements in the AFGAR system um, database, in the NCANS database, and in a number of other um, in a number of other reporting mechanisms. And so that's kind of overall why this is happening. But beyond that, I want to tell you that this, anything that has to do with our response here in Minnesota to trafficking and exploitation of children and youth broadly falls under the safe harbor umbrella. And so we're going to talk about safe harbor in just a moment. But I want to say that this is so critical having documentation within SSIS of the child welfare response to trafficking, because that gives us data about this large problem that we have in our state. It tells us who is impacted by trafficking. It tells us what the response looks like. It tells us how many alleged offenders we have. And this is critically important to the functioning of our safe harbor network. This information that you all input is being used in the aggregate to make the case for more funding, for better responses, for different responses that decrease disparities. And so data leads to identification of needs, which leads to resources, services, and better responses. So please, please document. Go ahead, Eric, next slide. All right, so I'm gonna give you one quick example. I don't know if, if any of you also have access to uh, being able to see some of the trends um, or if that's something that people are interested in. That would be a really great topic for the discussion at the end. Um, so we have data that is then captured from SSIS and I see it in a dashboard here at DHS. As a human trafficking child protection coordinator, I get to see this updated data every month. And it explores four different domains. I put this up on the screen just to show you. This is one screenshot of what we can see based on the data that you all are entering. So this, so the different, the four different domains, one is reports and intakes. The second is results in investigations. The third is around placement, out of home placement. And the fourth is around runaway youth and identification within the SEY, STY screen. So all of those things we're gonna talk about today, those are the different dashboards that I have access to where all this information goes into. So looking at this screen just for a moment. So this is data that you see is updated um, through February 3rd. And this is showing us the total number of reports in our state. So you can see here, 1,818 reports of trafficking of children, minors, or exploitation of minors. These reports are broken down here. This is since the beginning of our new mandate in May of 2017. And these reports in this screenshot are broken down by race. They are also, you'll notice, broken down by the percentage screened in. So this is one sample of what we can see. And I can tell you that this data in the aggregate has been used and is shared through our Safe Harbor Network to help people better understand who we are serving and so that we can better serve them with more specific responses. Next. 
Okay, so one brief moment on safe harbor. So hopefully many of you are familiar with our safe harbor response. It essentially is the law that passed in, that went into effect in 2014 in our state that said children who are involved in commercial sexual activity are victims and not criminals. And now today in 2021, we have four main agencies that are doing work to make this response happen across the state. So our Department of Health, is the agency that sponsors or that funds our supportive services and nine regional navigators, as well as providing training and protocol development and compiling information for the biannual safe harbor evaluation, which is where one of the ways that our data from SSIS is used regarding the child welfare response. Um, our Department of Human Services is focused on funding, the, the funding administration for the Safe Harbor Shelter and Housing, as well as Youth Outreach, our Child Welfare Response that Darianne and I are partnering with all of you on, our response um, within adult protection, as well as a lot of training and technical assistance. The Department of Public Safety has our statewide Minnesota Human Trafficking Investigators Task Force, which is a law enforcement task force, as well as providing funding for training and other task forces around the state. And then we also have protocol, simple protocol guidelines for community responses to exploitation and trafficking that are housed within MinCASA and the Advocates for Human Rights. Next slide, please, Eric. Okay, so we, there's a lot of information. So we have put together, we being, yay, Eric. Eric <laughs> has put together a job aid for you all. Eric, can you give the 30 second version of what the job aid is? I know you're gonna get into it in more detail later. But what is this document? Well, uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, when we talked about putting together a webinar uh, regarding the data entry components for human trafficking and exploitation, um, Sarah guided me to the best practice guide that you use for that policy best practice, but then we realized that we don't really have a system uh, best practice guide for all of you. So using the outline of the best practice guide, uh, we put together you know, collaboratively um, the screens in SSIS that we would like people to focus on in terms of entering the correct data so that um, the outputs of the data that uh, Sarah and Darianne look at um, are reflective of, you know, accuracy, et cetera. So that's my 30 second elevator speech on this job aid. <laughs> awesome, good. And I understand that you all have access to it and will have access to it um, to answer questions or to be a, a reference for you. Is that correct, Eric? That's correct. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So next slide then. I'm gonna give you, here we go. It is 920. Oops, so this is where that new slide that we just made would be plugging in, Eric. Oh. <laughs> um, guys, it is real time. We are making this as we go. Um, so do we have the slide or do we not have the slide? One Eric? second. We have the slide in one second. So I see one number one by the Q&A. So I am going to just jump there, Eric, while you put the slide up. So Katie, thank you very much for your first, the first question. If I had a prize to give you and we weren't in Zoom, I would do that because it's hard to ask the first question. So um, Katie says, I'm curious about the runaway debriefing form. It's confusing to use runaway instead of missing youth. Missing youth is the language used as we talk about safe harbor, SY and STY. Awesome question. Thank you so much for that. And you are exactly right. Katie, that would be two prizes for you. Um, so basically, the reason that we say runaway is because our is because the federal law, and then in turn the state law that implements it, and then in turn the policy guidance that was developed around responding to this population based on the reporting requirements uses the term runaway. And so that's kind of the general reason why it's there. I think that it is very well worth a conversation to see if we might make some changes in that language um, to say, instead, we don't want to talk about these youth as runaway youth. We want to talk about them as missing youth because you are correct that that is what they are. Darian, any comments on that? Sorry, and if you don't, that's okay, but I thought you might 
want to say something. If you can unmute. You covered it. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't unmute. No, I think that, that that's a really great question because we do say that we want to reframe that language and that these that youth are missing and that they're not necessarily running away. There could be lots of different reasons why they're missing. Um, and so I think that that brings up a great point and something that we should consider as um, we continue to improve that response and um, documentation within our SSIS system too. Yeah, thanks Katie and thanks Darian. Okay, so here we go guys. Here's your high level overview. Um, there are five main pitfalls that we see and hopefully through this webinar, through this uh, coffee talk today, you all will learn how to get around those pitfalls, how to not fall into them, so that instead these can be your top five tips for what you do when you document trafficking um, and exploitation in SSIS. So for right now, they're pitfalls. So number one thing that we see that is problematic within SSIS is, and this is the overarching issue that impacts everything else we're gonna talk about, that often, workers do not have a really clear understanding of what is sexual exploitation of a youth and what is sex trafficking of a youth. That distinction makes a big difference in all of these other pitfalls and across all of the documentation because there are different responses for sexual exploitation, which does not involve a third party trafficker and cannot involve a non-caregiver and sex trafficking, which can involve a non-caregiver as an alleged offender. And it must involve a third party in the commercial sex act. Okay, so second top pitfall. Again, these building off the first one, these non-caregiver alleged traffickers. We often see some some um, confusion in documenting them as alleged offenders, some confusion in when they are alleged offenders, and some confusion during the interview, uh, interview, during the interviews, during the documentation of the investigation, um, as far as what do we need in order to determine, um, and how do we document a determination, and when do we send a letter, and how can we, when do we close when we have a non-caregiver alleged sex? Third, um, the SEY, STY screen. Again, it's here, there is a problem with the understanding of the, the definitions, the actual questions on the screen, but the bigger issue is around when to document. When you've identified a youth, how do you know when to go in and document on that SEY, STY screen? How do you know if you need to redo the screen? So, um, so that's that one. The fourth, SDM tools, when to use them and when not to use them. When do they fit for exploitation? When do they not fit um, for exploitation and trafficking cases, um, for work groups related to exploitation and trafficking? And then fifth, the runaway response. Asterisk to Katie's comment, the response for missing youth. Um, so here we see issues related to closing work groups too soon, um, and also not documenting, not utilizing the runaway debriefing form or documenting the completion of that runaway debriefing form. Okay, top five pitfalls. Now you have the big picture. If you want to start asking questions, you may, although no, we're going to go into detail on each and every one of these over the next hour and four minutes. So you also might want to listen in and then ask a more specific question when we get to the top. So Eric, next. Slide. We are jumping into topic one, and hey, we are only like um, 16 minutes behind schedule. Oh, hold so, on. Oops, hold on. this is not the slide. <laughs> if we go there, we skip right to the discussion, which would really spice it up, but it might leave people really confused also. <laughs> Apparently, adding a slide. Um, threw me off, so I apologize about that. Oh, no problem, Eric. So we are gonna go to topic one in just a moment. Um, and this first topic is everything you need to know about child maltreatment report related documentation. So next slide, this is the overall child protection response and how it's documented. So here's our starting point, child maltreatment report. We're gonna go through the policy quickly. Eric's gonna walk you through some practical side and then we're gonna take um, answer any Q and A that's fine. So where do we start? When we're talking about the child maltreatment report, 
you need to know that there are four types of reports that you could be documenting. One is a report of alleged sex trafficking of a child. The second is a report of alleged sexual exploitation of a child. And the third is a report of alleged labor trafficking of a child. And the fourth is any of the above plus other types of maltreatment. So I broke it down into those four categories because those documentation paths are gonna look a little bit different. So next slide, please, Eric. Okay, so in order to understand this, we have to start with what is Minnesota's child protection response. And I'm gonna guess and hope that many, many, many of you have already seen this slide, have already gotten this content in new worker training or the two-day child welfare training on trafficking and exploitation, um, or in any of our other webinars, um, but on the chance that you have not, and this is new to you. Since May 29th of 2017, all sex trafficking involving children in Minnesota is a form of sexual abuse. So star that, it's an allegation detail under sexual abuse. It is a form of child abuse and neglect and it requires that the response path selected is an investigation, okay? So the basics here, this is coming back to all the notes here on the bottom of the slide regarding the basics are coming back to our top pitfall, which is the definitional point, okay? So sex trafficking, is a mandated report even if it involves a non-caregiver and sex trafficking has three parts in the definition. We have to have all three of these in order to have an allegation of sex trafficking. There has to be first the right actor, third party trafficker. That's in addition to the purchaser of a commercial sex act and the child victim who has provided, who has been involved in the commercial sex act. There has to be an appropriate action, which is receiving the child, this purpose, recruiting the child, harboring the child, providing the child or obtaining them, or the action can be profiting from the commercial sex act. And then the actual act in statute, again, coming back to Katie's excellent first question, we're using language here only on this one slide that is the language in the statute. Oops, Sarah, I think we lost your audio. Uh, one moment, ladies and gentlemen. Sarah, I apologize, but you cut out. Um, just do a quick check on your audio and reconnect. Uh, your phone says it's muted, so if you unmute your phone, I think we'll be able to hear you again. Bear with us one moment. Technical difficulties.
Now can you hear me? Now can you Yes. Oh my goodness. I am really sorry about that. It kicked me out of all of the audio options. So um so that was a little bit of a breathing break. And hopefully <laughs> you all had a chance to read over this slide that <laughs> up on the screen. Um okay, so I'm really sorry about that. Um let's let's move on. Um this is the basic construct for what the response is. Go ahead to the next slide, Eric. Okay, so really one of the most helpful things, most helpful tools that you can utilize is on the screen here. It's also found along with all of our best practice guide and all of the resources we've created for child welfare staff who are responding to trafficking or exploitation. This is our intake flowchart. This walks you through the definitions of exploitation and trafficking and an element by element based on the statutory definition. And it also tells you at the end, at the bottom row here, what needs to happen with a report that, that um, falls into either sexual exploitation by a caregiver, sexual exploitation by a non-caregiver, sex trafficking, or none of them, neither sexual exploitation or sex trafficking. So this tool really walks you through the response um, and most importantly walks you through the definition. Go on to the next slide, please, Eric. Okay. Right. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> we'll give Sarah a break. Sorry, Sarah, for the technical difficulties. Um, Zoom can be kind of tricky sometimes. But um, now we're going to talk about um, documenting in SSIS. So once again, the DHS 7641N is your child protection, sex trafficking, and sexual exploitation intake tool that we were viewing on the previous slide. Um, it's for uh, child welfare agency supervisors, intake and screening staff, and screening teams. Um, when determining whether a report meets the criteria for sex trafficking or sexual exploitation. Uh, the tool has an intake flowchart, glossary of terms, and list of common indicators, as we saw on that previous slide. And documentation of that tool should be listed on the description of incident tab within the child maltreatment report, according to our best practice guide. Uh, now we're going to navigate over to the allegations tab and just kind of a quick walk through and overview. Uh, we go into greater detail about each one of these fields, but I know we're kind of off time today and I want to be respectful of our presenters time and just kind of give you a high level overview or walk through of the allegation screen in matters of uh, sex trafficking. So uh, under the allegation container, we want to list sexual abuse as our allegation. Uh, if we know who the alleged victim is, uh, we're going to bring them into this field. However, if we do not know who the victim is or we just simply have a description, we're gonna enter that information into the alleged victim description field. The alleged offender, again, um, if we know who that offender is, we're going to list them in the alleged offender field. Uh, for sex trafficking, if it's related to non-caregiver sex trafficking, there is an option um, down here under the relationship field to select non-caregiver sex trafficking. And then uh, just circling back or backtracking a little bit, if you don't know who the alleged offender, offender is by name, you'll put the description in the description field itself. And then obviously you have a warning symbol over here to put the date of occurrence. Uh, navigating down to the allegation detail information for sex trafficked youth, we want to select uh, sex trafficked for the allegation detail. You're going to select a screening decision. For the presentation today, we just used screened in, but there are a few other options under the screening decision, including screen out or um, another jurisdiction. Uh, and then we have the screening reason here. We want to select um, new allegation. Uh, for new reports, if there's an existing work group uh, where similar allegations with the same victim being assessed, uh, workers will select currently being assessed. 
Screening date is the date of the screening of the screening. And then we require a 24 hour response for sex traffic youth. And that will autofill with the word yes when we choose sex traffic as our allegation detail. And then for the 24 hour response requ uh, required reason, we want to select sexual exploitation, prostitution, or sex trafficking. Uh, <clears throat> for sexual exploitation, uh, we want to again select on our allegation tab of the child maltreatment report sexual abuse. Um, again, if our victim is known, their name will be listed. If our alleged offender is known, their name should be listed. Um, the alleged victim description or offender description, obviously, again, you're going to put descriptions here if you don't know the name. And then um, offender relationship, again, for sex sexual exploitation to be screened in at an agency, um, we, the, the um, option to select under here would be some, some type of caregiver, because uh, we're not going to screen in sexual exploitation when it's related to a non-caregiver. We're going to refer that out uh, for a child welfare response. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. <laughs> and then again, you have the screening decision, the screening reason, the screening date, Again, we have a 24 hour uh, response required uh, for sexual exploitation and matters of sexual exploitation with caregiver. And then again, for our 24 hour response uh, required reason, we're gonna select sexual exploitation, prostitution and sex trafficking again. <clears throat> for sexual exploitation with caregiver as well as sex trafficking, the investigation um, is always required. So this is just showing the track assignment tab for um, showing that the investigation is required. And this track assignment tab again is found on the child maltreatment report. Um, now we navigated over to the initial notifications tab of the child maltreatment report. And from the action menu, we're gonna select a uh, new initial notification. And we always wanna cross report sexual exploitation or trafficking with law enforcement. So this screen is just showing you that we've cross reported to law enforcement. We've selected that from our dropdown. Uh, we can put an agency description under the agency description field, the date that it was cross reported, how it was cross-reported, was it uh, delivered orally or in writing or both? And then the person that you notified. And then a couple of hints before we leave this slide, all reports of alleged sexual exploitation and sex trafficking, again, as I've indicated, uh, regardless of screening decision need to be cross-reported to law enforcement. And then for reports of trafficking or exploitation occurring in multiple jurisdictions, with multiple alleged offenders or alleged victims, local uh, social service agencies may find uh, multi-jurisdictional or statewide law enforcement and human trafficking task forces to be helpful. And then um, within the job tutorial itself, the job aid that uh, we linked in the chat at the beginning of our discussion today, or Heidi had sent out, there's a link for uh, the Minnesota Safe Harbors Services map, which provides contact information um, and service areas for the Safe Harbor Regional Navigators statewide. And regional navigators may consult with social service agency staff to help identify and make service referrals for youth who are at risk of or experienced sexual exploitation or sex trafficking. Um, all those making reports related to sex trafficking or sexual exploitation should be provided with contact information for the appropriate regional navigator. This information should be provided at the time of the report or when a report is notified of a screening decision or a reporter, I should say, is notified of a screening decision. Then I wanna talk a little bit about labor trafficking. Um, when new reports of child maltreatment are screened, screeners may find indicators of labor trafficking. These indicators, um, uh, workers can identify these indicators by using DHS 76410, titled Identifying and Responding to Labor Trafficking. And again, this is linked in that tutorial. So the primary indicators, screeners and screening teams 
should look for is um, child being forced or threatened or compelled to work for another person. And work can include both formal employment and informal or illegal activities. Um, this information is all listed within this document here. And then um, this uh, screenshot here on this slide just shows that the labor trafficking tool was used uh, when screening the report in with just a little guidance here um, in a case note. Um, you can put in your comments section to title your case note, labor trafficking worksheet and summary, and you would indicate that in the body of the case note. Lots of information oh. to throw at you. Um, it took a lot longer than 15 minutes, but we are at the first uh, Q&A section here. So if you guys have questions, feel free to throw them into the Q&A. Go ahead, Sarah, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Eric. Um, and I do not see any new questions right now. I did respond to one um, during during the discussion or during the actual content um, regarding connection of a youth with Safe Harbor um, services. So, um, and Eric did reference that as well. So just to mention that, again, that you can access through our best practice guide or on the DHS Safe Harbor website, you can use that as a hub to get access to all of the Safe Harbor responses, services, providers, navigators across the state as well. Darianne, did you wanna jump in at all? No, okay, let's move on. Oh no, you can't talk either. Okay, let's move on to topic two for now and please do go ahead and continue to put questions into the Q&A. Um, and we will answer them when we pause for our next Q&A or um, in writing. So, okay, so the second topic area is investigations. We're gonna try and go through this a little bit more quickly. Key areas to focus on that we're gonna talk about documentation around will be um, interviews of the child victim, the alleged offender and the parents and caregivers, medical and mental health treatment, how to document that important, very important um, area of services for this population of kids, um, the structured decision-making tools and safety planning, um, which looks a little bit different when it comes to sex trafficking, particularly involving non-caregivers, um, and then the SEY, STY screen, which is probably one of the areas that we get the most questions about. We are going to go into, Eric's gonna go into some detail around that. And then finally, a little bit about maltreatment determinations and those determination letters and sequential documentation with this population. Okay, so I have one more slide to do. Next slide, Eric, and then I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, I wanted to just give you the brief um, kind of high level overview of what a sex trafficking investigation looks like within child protection. Um, and this is going to kind of map onto what then needs to be documented. So sex trafficking requirements for um, sex trafficking investigations um, in specifically involving non-caregivers, um, but really involving any alleged offender um, are gonna have some key components to them. The first, um, throughout our child protection statute, now in 260E, um, there is a requirement to coordinate the investigation with any law enforcement agency that is also investigating the same set of allegations. Um, that coordination should be documented throughout um, the investigation work group um, in a variety of different contexts. Um, one that one of the key like early um, areas of the investigation is that alleged victim face-to-face -face contact that Eric and I have spoken about. Again, that's really to assess the safety of the child. That is not intended when it comes to sex trafficking to be the mo best moment to do a full interview of the child. Rather, that's a good time to begin your safety planning. And we do have a safety planning resource that is designed specifically for creating safety plans for youth and families who have experienced exploitation or trafficking. Um, then often we see in the flow of the case that the next 
thing to look at is whether placement is necessary for the child. There will be, we'll talk about in the discussion at the end, some of the policy changes that are coming um, regarding placement, as you all might be aware, under the Family First Prevention and Services Act. Um, and um, and a little bit we'll talk about the documentation around placement, although honestly that will probably come more in a revised version of the job aid um, if changes are made to SSIS. Um, so then another key area is the alleged offender and primary caregiver interviews um, and the referrals to services. Um, which will, which can include the medical and mental health services, but also really in these cases often include some referral to specific services through our safe harbor network, um, if appropriate for the child. And then finally, the actual maltreatment determination in the investigation. So that's kind of your high level overview of what the investigation requirements are when it comes to sex trafficking. And Eric, I'm gonna hand it over to you to jump into the documentation details and give them a bit of a walkthrough. All right. So again, consult the Minnesota Best Practices Response to Trafficking and Exploitation of Children and Youth, uh, pages 14 to 16, for more guidance related to necessary coordination with law enforcement, uh, interviews of alleged victim, parents, caregiver, and alleged offender, caregiver or non-caregiver. Um, what we want to do, um, just kind of a basic overview, is look at the activity uh, when we are conducting those interviews. So um, under chronology in SSIS, under either your work group or your activity log, and then selecting the work group, you're gonna select um, that new activity, and you're gonna use the service 104 for child protection investigation. And you're gonna choose the applicable interview type from the activity dropdown. And as you can see, there's several things to choose from underneath uh, the 104 service umbrella. But uh, what we're talking about really right now is that assessment or investigation adult interview or the child observation interview. So you're gonna select one or the other uh, depending on who you're interviewing. Um, and then we have the duration field where you're going to document the duration of that interview. And then a uh, case note, you know, the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, all of the details, please enter them in this note section of your activity because this will turn into a case note once you save this activity. Um, and then if you, want more space to enter information to, into, um, as you all may know, you can select the blue E editor button to expand that and it'll bring you to a word processing type of uh, format for you to continue to enter all of the details of that interview. And then we have <clears throat> the purpose section, which is not required, but we often in uh, beginner training, alert trainees that this is gonna give, you know, as your chronology grid builds, um, you're gonna wanna title certain things so that you can find things a little bit easier rather than trying to select something and, and guess, you know, what the contents of that case note are or that time activity. So when you enter something in the purpose field, you're actually giving um, a title within the grid as to what that particular entry is all about. So um, in this example, I just use interview with alleged victim. And then um, in order for the interview to stop the clock in SSIS for timeliness purposes, you need to have a completed um, child observation interview within that 24 hour period of time. Um, but we do not discourage people to enter the attempted activities as well, because as you all are trying to balance everything, there are several attempts to make contact with families. So enter those attempts as well. And then you wanna select which method, was it face-to-face, -face, et cetera, the location of that interview, and then the contact that you had or who you made contact with, um, you wanna indicate that down here in the bottom right-hand corner. So just wanted to emphasize, uh, you know, co coordinating with law enforcement. If you don't see your law enforcement professional in here and you want to add them in, 
you can simply um, add them in this free text field here add Officer Smith or whatever, and then simply select add, and they will be added to your list of contacts for this. The next thing I wanna talk about is um, the child, you know, ch children, child victims of sex trafficking or sexual exploitation should be referred for medical and mental health evaluations and appropriate treatment as early as possible by the local child welfare agency. Um, Chemical dependency services may also be necessary to address dependency concerns or withdrawal. Uh, workers may wish to document medical care in SSIS under the medication checkup folder as shown on this slide. By selecting new checkup, um, the date of that checkup, the checkup type as uh, drawn from the drop down here, and then uh, the healthcare provider. Uh, the healthcare provider field is not a free text field. You can't simply type Dr. Johnson or whatever um, in this field. You have to actually perform a healthcare provider search. So if you go in to search for this particular doctor that the youth has seen and you can't find them in your system, you can go to the um, health insurance folder and add a new provider under there. I don't go into great detail because I didn't want to take too much time away from this presentation, but you can add new healthcare providers under the health slash insurance folder. And then when you search under the medication and checkup folder, you should be able to uh, find that provider in your system. Uh, caseworkers have a responsibility to assess the safety of children throughout the life of a case and take steps to help keep them safe. The initial safety assessment should be in coordination again with law enforcement whenever possible. In sex trafficking or sexual exploitation cases involving caregiver alleged offenders, the structured decision-making SDM tools are required. So again, that's for caregivers only. None of the SDM tools are required in sex trafficking cases involving non-caregiver alleged offenders and it is, as it is not designed uh, for this type of case. And then again, you can consult the Structured Decision-Making System Policy and Procedure Manual for policy-related information related to SDM tools. And that again is going to be linked in your tutorial. Uh, we wanna to highlight the different child welfare uh, program areas that require the SEY and STY screen entry, which we will be talking about momentarily. Um, as you can see on your screen, there's quite a few child welfare programs that will require documentation on the SEY, STY screen. And those include adolescent services, or I'm sorry, adolescent living skills, um, adoption and guardianship, chemical dependency general, Child Brain Injury Waiver, Child Community Access for Disability Inclusion, otherwise known as CADI, uh, Child Community Alternative Care, CPS, Child Protective Services, uh, Child Welfare General, Children's Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities General, Early Intervention, Minor Parents and Parent Support and Outreach. So now we get to the SEY, STY folder in SSIS. And we see this very first question here. Has the child ever been a victim of commercial sexual exploitation per federal law? Um, you obviously wanna create a new SEY, STY screen from the SEY, STY folder action menu. And then you're gonna answer the question, yes or no. If you need additional information, you have a plethora of resources like your best practice guide, or if you uh, wanna click on the blue underlined uh, help text, that will lead you to some information to help you make an informed decision on how to answer this question. If you answer this question, no, then no further action is required on this screen. 
However, if you answer the question, yes, then you will be um, required to answer questions two, three, and four. Has the child ever been a victim of sex trafficking, which involves a third party? The date of the mandated report to law enforcement will go into this field. And has the child ever been in foster care? Now, if you answer no to this question, you've completed the requirements of this screen. However, if the child has ever been in foster care, you will, uh, you will then be asked to answer questions five and six. Was the child a victim prior to entering foster care for the most recent continuous placement? Or was the child victim was the child a victim while in foster care during the most recent continuous placement? You can add additional comments into this screen. Um, um, it's optional and may include a brief description of when or how the child may have been victimized, which law enforcement agency received the mandated cross report, or whether other relevant documents have been compiled, such as runaway debriefing um, or request of assistance from the federal ACF, Office of Trafficking Persons. So lots of things uh, that you can put in here to help um, individuals who are reviewing the data understand why you answered the questions the way you answered them and what the follow-up was regarding that. And then you just have the bottom section. Um, there's an auto fill of the create date here, uh, depending on when you created this screen. Um, you can enter the date that the information was gathered. Um, worker name will default to the worker who created this screen, but you can change that information if you need to change it to a different worker. And then we have a finalized date um, after you have completed all of the required information you can, um, and saved, you'll, you'll get a finalized date here. Determinations and finalizing the child maltreatment report. Um, so we realized that um, not everything happens in linear fashion in the real world. So um, I'm just going in order as the tabs appear on the child maltreatment report. I'm not advising you of what order that you need to go into because you're gonna be entering information sporadically into each one of these tabs. But again, for training purposes, I just put them in order as I saw them. So under the allegation detail of the child maltreatment report, you're gonna enter whether or not maltreatment is determined as yes or no. And you're gonna enter the date of the determination when the maltreatment determination is yes, you're gonna enter the level of severity. And then um, I put the family conditions tab on this same slide as well, um, just because it fit, but um, we do have a family conditions tab and you're gonna note any family conditions that were discovered throughout the investigation that may help to inform case planning or future case planning. Then we have the uh, recommended services tab. Again, um, we're recommending services if uh, child protection case management is ongoing or, need, or will help us help inform uh, future services. So again, we wanna make selections over here in the check boxes for recommended future services for this individual or for their family or both. Then we have the newly designed victim information tab. A lot of the top information here is the same, but we do have that additional child observation interview section, which I won't go into great detail about, but we're gonna ensure that all of the required fields are filled out on the victim information tab. Um, the victim living situation, or yes, the victim living situation, the juvenile court petition, if any, um, child observation interview, and then we have a prenatal exposure section as well on the screen. I'm getting some chats, so I'm just going to take a break here. Okay. Looks like we're good. And then we have uh, complete the conclusions tab and indicate whether or not CP services will be needed. Uh, provide any conclusion comments that are pertinent to this report in the free text field, including reasons for ongoing 
Child Protection Case Management Services. Um, case management services may be offered through child protection or child welfare, and youth may be referred for child welfare case management following an assessment for sexual exploitation or labor trafficking. Um, so this comment section here is where you're gonna wanna document the reason for ongoing child protection case management services. And I just wanted to kind of ask Sarah or Darianne if they had anything they wanted to add to um, my commentary. There is a, before I ask you though, there is a link within the tutorial for individuals who may re, uh, qualify for ch uh, child welfare targeted case management. So there's a link to the latest bulletin on all of that information. Sarah or Darianne, did you have anything to add? Um, I think Darianne's not able to unmute, um, but I will, um, I think we do have a number of questions in the Q&A, so maybe we could jump to those. Um, and then um, it, a lot of them, most of them are about the SEY, STY screen. Um, although one preliminary question is, will, is this being recorded so that people who could not attend can watch it? Um, so I believe it will be sent out, correct, Eric? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, we do save the videos um, and we download them to Vimeo. So we, when we get requests, we can send them out. We don't have an, uh, an, a landing page assigned just yet for all of our webinars, but hopefully someday we will. But we do kind of do it upon request at this point. Okay, so if um, I see two people here asked for it, um, you're saying that this video will not be sent out to everyone who registered, but instead they would have to email Heidi or you to get the video if they want well, it? Maybe Heidi wants to add any information about that, or maybe we can send the information out in a mentor blast afterwards. Heidi, do you, what would you recommend? Good morning, everybody. Um, we should have the video ready probably this afternoon. Um, I can certainly send it out in a mentor blast um, so that everybody should have it by the end of the week, if that works. That's great. Okay, thank you. So then, um, and um, okay, so then let's get to the substance questions here um, around the SEY, STY screen. So a number of them um, coming in about that. So first, Eric, are you able to talk a little bit more to, um, I know you had that slide up about which group path, which work group require, when do you get that data cleanup message for the SEY, STY screen completion? There are two questions in here about that. Um, do you see those here, Eric? Specifically listing. Yep, go ahead. Um, is the SEY STY folder also required for DD waiver when assessments are completed? Um, the screen that you see is um, the child welfare areas that I took from the specification document. So I don't know off the top of my head if DD waiver assessments will require this screen, um, but I can definitely look into that. Um, my, my assumption would be that any assessments that you're doing in SSIS that relate to child welfare services are gonna require the screen. So that's my best educated guess at this time, but I don't like to give uh, false information either. So I wanna back that up by saying that I'll follow up. <laughs> yep. And then there's a similar question um, from Jody um, that's under the answered. We said it would, we would answer it live. Um, it has been our experience that SSIS will force the completion of the SEY screens for programs that are not required. And then she lists here some um, CD, CW work groups for the purpose of adoption, assistance, reassessment, children and licensing work groups, et cetera. Um, and then, so I guess the first question is, is it required for those groups? And if it is not, um, then how, what do they do? Because it is popping up. If it's showing up as required, um, I only know the answer to that question if you're not able to obtain that information. 
and that is to simply mark the question or question one. I'm going to go back to the slide. And this is based on uh, your guys' feedback as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not mm -hmm. making this up. <laughs> so you would yeah. just simply, if you don't have the information, you don't have the information. So you would simply answer no to the first question. And I know uh, individuals kind of feel iffy about that. Like, um, am I entering false information? But if you were not able to obtain it um, in that timeline, then you were not able to obtain it. So you would just simply create the screen and answer no. Um, I had went as far as maybe saying to enter comments that, you know, was not obtained during the assessment, but it sounds mm -hmm. like we just want to answer that question. No, correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, that is, that is the best way to proceed. If you do, um, if it does pop up and you are not able to get the information at this point. Um, so, Okay, so those were the questions around the SEY STY screen. Um, and I'm trying to see if there's one, if there's anything else. Um, again, more kind of comments on that same top. Um, so then I think, um, okay, one more one more came up around the SEY STY screen again. So when should it be redone is this, is this next question, which is a great question. So um, this should be reviewed and you stated it really well, Jody, um, that it should be reviewed when um, a new um, assessment, when there's a new report of trafficking or exploitation, then that is a good time to redo the SEY STY screen if you learn that yes, now the child has been exploited or trafficked. Um, if there is, um, if the youth runs away or leaves a placement and then a debriefing form, runaway debriefing form is completed and you learn about um, trafficking or exploitation, that's another good time to, to review it because you might have a yes then, or if there's a new disclosure at any time, absolutely. Um, and then you did say in here too, uh, when there's new continuous placement, I would say to the extent that you learn new information about the child possibly experiencing exploitation or trafficking, that would also be a good time to complete it. Um, Eric, any, any other thoughts about that open question? Um, I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Sarah, every time a new CP report is screened in, um, is when that screen is going to need to be reviewed again. But, yep, and you do complete a new screen, right, Eric? She's asking yep, to yep. each time it's a new screen. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay, excellent. Well, we should move on um, to our final topic. We have 20, a little bit less than 20 minutes left. <clears throat> um, so please do continue to put questions in the Q&A about anything that we've covered so far, if it's not clear. Okay, so then moving on to our third topic, which is um, regarding youth who run away from placement. So, so one second here. Yep. Yeah. Instead of making everybody dizzy, I'm just gonna advance my slides on my end and then I'll reach. Sounds good. So on this topic, I wanted to say here, as we get started um, with this final topic, is this, um, this topic of youth missing from care or runaway youth um, is really based on federal and state law requirements around what the response should be and what needs to be documented and then what needs to be reported. Um, and so some of the main areas here. Okay, so when a youth runs away from care, there are requirements around who you need to notify, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or law enforcement within 24 hours, they have to be notified that a child has gone missing from care, from a placement. Um, and then the worker has to search for the child, has to continue um, to search for that child to try and find them after they've run away from care and that should be documented. Then once the child hopefully is recovered by either law enforcement or, or welfare or someone else and they are, um, either put into placement again or reunified, um, they're 
they are located, then there is a requirement that the runaway debriefing form be completed by the child welfare caseworker. Um, that form is found, as Eric will show you, in SSIS, and it must be completed um, after you have spoken with the child, talked with the child, basically about what happened while they were missing. Where did they go? Um, did anyone try to hurt them? Um, what is their feedback? You know, would they like to be in a different placement? Kind of what caused them to leave the placement? Um, that kind of thing. And then back for just a second, Eric, the slide before, that is the image of the runaway debriefing form. Um, and then also the, then where do you document? After you do the debriefing form, um, how do you document what you learned in that? So that is a really good time and important time to document, to redo a new SEY, STY form. Um, if you've learned new information about possible exploitation or trafficking. Um, and then also there, um, the, the whole goal behind this response is not only that you're identifying if a child has been trafficked or exploited while missing, but that you are then able to make possibly a different placement decision or maybe create some additional safety planning around that placement. So that's kind of the main high level points of the response. When youth run away from placement, again, this is um, required by both federal and state law and it's explained in more detail in our best practice guide and in the best practice guide that is specifically explaining the state laws around um, the response to runaway youth. Um, next slide, please. We already looked briefly at the runaway debriefing <laughs> form. Let's go on um, yep, to this one. Great. And then I will be handing it over to you, Eric. So this is a really important one to, um, to focus on for just a moment. So we do, as I mentioned, track the data regarding um, youth who run away from care or who are missing from care, and also um, the data that we learned through that SEY, STY. This is just a little sampling of what we have. I'm telling you this in part, I'm going to let you in on kind of something that's going on behind the scenes right now. And that is that um, five states selected about a year, um, at January of 2020, five states were selected for a review by the Federal Office of the Inspector General um, for the Health and Human Services Department. And that, um, means Minnesota was one of those five states that was selected. And there has been a review going on um, at the statewide level. Um, a random sample of cases from a certain um, time period was selected. And we had to provide all that data to the, um, to the federal reviewers. And here's what we found. There were 91 cases in the time frame, And we just received these results just about a week ago. And I wanted to just share with you what we found um, or what they found. Um, so there were 91 cases that they looked at from across the entire state. Um, in those 91 cases, 84 of them had no runaway debriefing form completed. So 91 cases in which a child was missing from care and then they were recovered and went back to the placement, okay? So in 84, there weren't any um, runaway debriefing forms. And in 85 cases, there was no new SEY, STY screening completed. Um, and out of those 91, there was one case in which um, there was a forensic interview completed after the child was um, located after being missing from care. So those were their high level findings. This is an important um, area for us to focus on how do we make some improvements and how we respond um, when you do go missing from care. Um, Eric, on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to you to do a really quick walkthrough. Um, and I will take a look at what came up in the Q&A and the chat while you do that. Great, thanks. So youth who are missing are at great risk of victimization and exploitation. And, and again, that's just wording taking, taken from uh, the bulletin 20-68-05, uh, responding to youth who run away from the foster care, uh, who, run, who run away from foster care practice guide. So um, the bulletin, again, is linked to the tutorial that we have uh, linked within our chat and Heidi sent out. 
So um, just a couple of things in SSIS to do uh, when a youth runs away. And that is one to update uh, the placement location and absence folder in SSIS and put in an end reason of runaway and the end date. <clears throat> the next thing that we want people to do is open up a new placement location and absence screen under the setting of unauthorized absence and reason of runaway. Um, notice in the midsection here, we have the notice of change of foster care placement location and absence or absence was provided to the court. And then we also have a required runaway debriefing form completed. Um, again, you're going to conduct the runaway debriefing uh, when the youth returns, but we are gonna noti uh, notify the court within 72 hours of a placement update or change. So um, this is what we want you to update the placement and location and absence folder to when a youth does run away. Um, from the chronology node action menu, we're going to select new document. This slide is heavy with screenshots, uh, but basically just kind of walks you through where to find the runaway debriefing form in SSIS so that you can conduct and enter that information into, um, like I said, the social service information system. So you're going to create that new document from the action menu in SSIS. Um, to filter it down, you can uh, go by group type and state and category and placement. And then the results you should see in your grid view or in the tree view, which is not pictured on this slide, is that runaway debriefing form in the grid. Um, you'll get a preview of that runaway debriefing form. Um, you'll select it down here in the bottom right-hand corner on that particular screen. And then you can bring the runaway debriefing form into edit mode and enter that debriefing into SSIS directly. Then we also have the notice to court of placement change in SSIS as well. You're gonna bring that up uh, the same way under chronology, new document. Um, and then to filter it, you can um, do a group type of state and uh, the category of report to the court. And you should be able to find that notice of court or notice to court of placement change in your grid. <clears throat> and then you can bring it into <clears throat> Excuse me. And then all supervisory meetings, efforts to locate children, um, agency actions to notify caregivers, agency actions to notify law enforcement or court, as well as uh, actions once the child is located and returned must be documented in SSIS case notes. So um, we want to title those case notes first and foremost with the word runaway and then add further context when necessary. Again, you create those case notes in chronology under the work group. We have any questions? Is there a time frame for a child to be considered a runaway? For example, child leaves school at noon and is located by 5 p.m. that evening. I'm going to turn that one over to you, Sarah. Yeah, and I've been searching, actually, checking um, if there is a definition in statute or in the runaway response best practice guide, and I am not coming up with one other than the time frame that, it, that it's definitely less than 24 hours because that the reports have to be made and the search has to begin in less than 24 hours from when the child first goes missing. Um, but I am going to have to search a little bit more to, to find if there is actually a definition. I mean, we loosely say that whenever, basically as soon as the, the worker is notified that the child's whereabouts are not known, that, um, that this ball should start rolling. But there, I don't know of the precise, like if you said five hours, is that sufficient? to be considered missing or is it a little bit more gray than that? Um, so I'm gonna have to dig into that a bit more um, and, and try and find that response. I'm happy to 
if I don't find it in the next eight minutes, I'm happy to try and um, Heidi, if it's possible to send that out with the um, mentor, with the message where you send out the recording. That would be one option. Okay. Yeah, does that work? Okay. Um, all right, so thanks for that question and we'll try to get to the bottom of it. Um, okay, let's move on. We have just seven minutes left in our time together today. And I don't see any other questions in the Q&A right now. Right. So this next slide is that, that added slide again. I hope that's correct. Uh-huh, yep. So right. again, zooming back out, top five things that we wanted to make sure that you learned um, today that we focused on. The first is really understanding those, knowing about the differences between exploitation and trafficking um, so that you can properly document both types of situations in SSIS. The second was looking at how do we document non-caregiver alleged sex traffickers and what are the differences. The third was the SEYSTY screen, which we spent quite a bit of time on. That does need to be a new screen completed whenever new information is learned that, that causes you to identify that the child may have been either commercially sexually exploited, which would be question one, or sex trafficked involving a third party, which would be question two. Um, those SDM tools, again, only in situations that involve non care or that involve caregivers or parents should those tools be completed. Otherwise, we recommend using our planning document to, um, as a way to begin assessing um, immediate safety concerns and planning around it. Um, and then fifth, the response to youth missing from care. So making sure that you're doing those debriefings, making sure that you are keeping those work groups open and continuing to search for those youth until they are located. Um, okay, and I do see one other question came in. Um, great question. Are tribes required to complete the runaway debriefing form? So the, the agencies that are required would be um, any of the child welfare um, initiative tribes would have to complete any of the state requirements. If, if um, for other tribes who have their own child welfare um, responses, as all the tribes do, um, but they are not initiative tribes, they've not opted into following the state. Um, all the state policies and laws. And so no, they would not be required, though they could choose to utilize that tool um, within their child welfare policies within their tribe if they want to. Um, anyone have anything to add to that one? And um, I see here, we were told they don't do them. So um, I would say the overall theme with the runaway debriefing form is that many agencies don't do it. Um, so, it, could be sometimes child welfare initiative tribes, or it could be county child welfare agencies. Um, actually, across the board, we're seeing some inconsistency in when those runaway debriefing forms are completed. Um, so I would say it's something for everyone to work towards trying to do, um, trying to make sure it gets completed when a youth is located after going missing from care. And I'd be happy to talk with folks more about that. Um, Okay, and I don't see anything additional that has come in for Q&A right now. Could we go to our next slide then? We'll wrap up with, in, um, with these final kind of comments here. I wanted to just share, um, as many of you are likely aware that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of changes that are in the works right now. Um, in large part related to Family First. So I will highlight um, a couple of those really briefly. But there is, um, there are changes to residential services related to Title IV-E reimbursement and one area but that impacts traffic um, exploited and at risk youth is by creating some specialized placement options that will be reimbursable under with Title IV-E funds. Um, and Specifically, youth were identified and documented in SSIS as having experienced sex trafficking or commercial sexual exploitation or who meet our new definition of at risk for trafficking or exploitation, those youth would be eligible to be placed in these specialized new um, settings 
for congregate settings for youth who have been trafficked, exploited, or at risk. And there would be Title IV E dollars for that. So there is a lot of policy work that is going on right now to develop the requirements, to develop the documentation process, um, and to publish those definitions. I can tell you those will be out in the next couple of weeks, it looks like. Um, and that um, I would really love to talk with any of you who have questions about that or who would like to get more information. You can check our CHS Safe Harbor website. We're adding new content of the day um, about these family first, new family first requirements um, and we will be publishing a revised version of our best practice guide that will include more content around placement um, as we prepare for family first to go into effect. There also will be down the line some changes around prevent placement prevention services um, under family first and those also um, will relate eventually to youth who have been trafficked, exploited, or who are at risk. Um, we are also developing some new, we're in the process of trying to develop some more specialized responses and resources relating to American Indian youth um, who have been trafficked or exploited and are um, within the child welfare system. And all of these will be coming, not only are there some um, policy and practice and resource changes, but there also will be some training available for you all so that you can um, get up to speed on what is happening with these important new areas. Um, so next slide, Eric, I think we're winding down here. We have one, oh, we're not going to do that one a third time. So um, we have run out of time here. Um, it is almost 1030. We, I guess I'll just end on this note that if you do have feedback, if you have more questions, if you want to discuss any of this further, um, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. As I said at the beginning, a lot of this is new. Um, the data collection is extremely important and we utilize it every day. Um, and so I really would be eager to hear how we could do better um, and eager to, to try and answer or uncover the answers to your questions um, if I don't immediately know them. So thank you so much for your time. I think, do we have one more slide that might have some information on it? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Please feel free to email me, sarah.lad at state.mn.us. Um, and I will also include my phone number um, in that follow up email that, so that you can feel free to also call me. Um, and as I understand, Eric um, and others, um, maybe are you available for questions related to the SSIS kind of technical side, or where would they go for those questions? Uh, we normally okay. refer individuals for uh, SSIS related questions to the SSIS help desk. So if you are a mentor, you have the opportunity to do that. If you're not a mentor, please reach out to your mentor and have those them phone those questions in or uh, send them in via email. Um, and then they usually will send them off to the training uh, unit for answers on any training documentation or anything like that. You can always contact me as well, but we like to filter those questions through the help desk so that we can see how many are coming in related to certain topics. So, Excellent. Well, thank you. And gosh, despite all of the technical problems that we had today, thanks for bearing with us. Um, challenges build character. So go forth. Have a great day. Please keep in touch if you've got more questions for us. And thanks for attending. Yes. Thank you, Sarah.